Hello, everyone. Um, as all of the speakers have said, it is so cool to see a live audience again. Um, for a couple of reasons. Um, the most important one of which is presenting to online audiences is the worst. Um, there's no feedback, there's no, you have no idea what's landing, what is and isn't going to work. Um, but there has been one thing about online presentations uh, that I've really enjoyed, and that's for online presentations where you had a pre-recorded talk and basically you watched your own talk together with the audience and there was a lot of sort of back and forths and questions and chats and conversations um, that were really good. So today is my attempt to see if we can sort of get the best of both worlds where I present, but we can still have a conversation and you figuring out uh, where you want to take this. Um, as Michelle has uh, covered in um, her introduction, um, I did build a startup, um, not quite as big as uh, Peter did, um, but um, yeah, completely sort of serverless, um, and be working as a product manager on the sort of Cloudflare developer platform. Um, where we do Cloudflare workers and the sort of adjacent sort of tech. Um, so yeah, I thought it was great. So when Dave asked me to talk, I sort of went back through and was like, wait a minute. Wasn't my first talk about serverless at Yao? Um, and it turns out that was true. Um, so my absolute first uh, talk about serverless was uh, in was what was then called uh, Yao West in 2016. Um, so this is me looking back at the last six years. What have I learned? What do I think is interesting? Uh, and we'll have a, a bit of a peek into the where is this going to take us, um, where we go further. But most important thing is um, at any point in time, sort of like raise your hand. Michelle is going to diligently, diligently sort of look around. Uh, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, grab a mic, ask a question, uh, share an opinion. Um, is that clear? Yeah, let's, let's try this thing out. Um, so I'm going to talk about serverless. Um, the first thing you have to know, and it's a thing that we keep forgetting um, to do in, in sort of IT software development all the time, is you should never call something about what it is not. Right? So, like when we talk about like no SQL, right? The sort of agile people with like the no estimates movements. Yeah? Yeah? Um, so, having all of like learned all of that, they at least didn't call it no servers. Uh, but serverless is um, only slightly less bad um, than any of that. So, what is service? Um, and here is um, the definition, uh, also known as my definition. Um, because I'm sure a bunch of people will disagree with this. Um, but the first thing that's important is running code in response to an event. Like, that's the code that I want to write. I want to sort of upload some code, and I want you as a vendor, or in my case, it's weird, because I want you to upload code to our servers, and we run that code for you. Right? That's, what, that's sort of like the most important thing. The other thing is related, to what I find interesting is like related to billing, right? I want to be billed per invocation. Yeah? I don't want to pay for a server for a month. I want you to bill by the amount of invocations. And we're, we're going to talk about uh, later about why this is such uh, a massive change. Um, and the next one is scaling from zero to any load, like seamlessly and instantly, right? Um, and this is sort of why the question is like lambda, uh, serverless or not? Uh, mostly. Um, sorry, Peter. I have to do a few of them, right? Um, but no, this is like these for me are the most important sort of aspects of serverless. I don't want to know about any servers. 
I want you, whenever this particular thing happens, I want you to run this piece of code. I want to build every time you do that. That's what I want to pay you. And I don't want to know how many requests there are. Yep. And that's what's important. So, when we talk about serverless, like what does, like, what does a, a, like a serverless execution look like? Um, and it turns out, after you've written um, a few tens of these, uh, they all follow the same pattern. Right? Remember, we are running code in response to an event. Right? So first we have to like, parse and, and sort of validate the event. Then we might need to fetch some additional data, although I prefer not to do this, but sometimes you can't get around this. Um, and at that particular moment, we have a decision to make. Right? There's some logic that we're going to have to execute. Right? And then it's a matter of saving the result of that decision or sending that information onwards. Right? If it sounds very straightforward, that's because it, uh, it is. Like, and that's what's so powerful about sort of serverless, is you have these sort of patterns that you keep seeing sort of over and over again. Um, now, has anyone heard of the term like FAS, like functions as a service? Yeah, forget about it. Right? Serverless is not functions as a service. It's a BS as a service. Right? Um, BS as a service is obviously uh, short for business step as a, fun as a service. Right? Um, do not think of the function like it's about the interconnections from where is that event coming to where are we going to save to where are we going to send. That's what's important. Right? So the function isn't all that important. Right? Like, it's just part of that sort of interconnectedness. Right? Think neurons versus a brain. Right? Like neurons are great, but they're pretty shit by themselves. Right? Like it's, it's in the interconnectedness that they provide value. Right? That we have a set of brains. Because it turns out we already have great ways to share functions. Right? We're called libraries. <laughs> like we've kept them around for ages. So never ever use your sort of serverless like as a function, like as a way to, like, as a way to reuse like logic. Yeah. A serverless function is about connecting. That's what's important. The actual execution, not so much. So before we sort of do that, any, any questions, disagreements, opinions? Right there at the back, Michelle. Hey, um, I guess where does the principle of having stuff that's loosely coupled come into that, where you wouldn't necessarily want to be thinking about those like external systems or dependencies? Amazing, amazing uh, question. The question is around like, uh, what about connectiveness? Um, when, I'm, when I, um, and it's, it's a good point, when I mean like sent somewhere, um, like we're, we're often talking about like a bus or something else where you like distribute, like, like a pub sub system where other 
services um, sort of can subscribe to events, for example. Uh, and we're going to talk about that sort of like a little bit a little bit later. Um, but um, yeah, like it might not be sort of like your one-to-one -one, um, uh, connections that you're sort of very much uh, sort of focused on, right? So you're correct. In when you're sending events, they may be uh, towards a pub sub sort of system, right? But you still have to. It's still about that interconnectedness, right? Where you go, like I'm going to now send this thing to the bus, so other um, other services can see that event. Um, yeah, great question. Anything else before we move on? Yeah, Michelle, run. Awesome. This is going way better than I thought. You're a great audience. Um, Erwin, so are we starting off by saying serverless and segregating that from a lambda? Is that what you're saying, sort of neuron versus brain? Lambda being the neuron, the brain being serverless as a design principle? Is that where we're starting with? Yeah, first of all, I'm obliged to point out that Lambda is just one way to run serverless. Uh, there happen to be many, many, many others, um, Cloudflare workers uh, being one of them. Uh, but like, there's, there's multiple, right? Like, uh, let's not pretend that like, these are the only two sort of things in town. It's Lambda, it's um, Google Cloud Function, and Azure has functions, and um, there's lots of functions. Um, but, but if you look at the Lambda, um, what I'm saying is, like, the Lambda is not just the code inside. Like, it's the configuration of the event that comes in and, like, what you're doing, where, where you're sending the event or where you're saving um, sort of things, right? So my point is it's not just a function. It's also a sort of configuration into the broader, broader ecosystem. Yeah. Does that? All right. So, now that we sort of have a little bit of a shared understanding of um, sort of where it's at, um, let's have a um, sort of think about what are some of the implications of this when you start to write applications, right? I, and that's um, sort of a bit different. Um, so I'm, I'm not talking about serverless in, um, to do one sort of thing on the side. This is a, what does it look like if you start to develop an application like serverless first, right? Like just what, as uh, sort of Peter was saying, um, is exactly what I, I have been doing, where he talked about the um, first look, is there any service, any, any existing service that does this? Um, then we're going to do it sort of serverless, um, and if anything else fails, we may do a container, right? Um, and, I, and I had, like, in my startup, there was one container. It was one function that was run as a container, and I, we, I couldn't get it to run on the serverless sort of way. Um, but let's start out. Because um, if you're starting to use um, sort of these principles of serverless first, what you're going to end up is an event-driven architecture. Right? And an event might just be an HTTP request coming in. Um, but after that, um, you are very much into that sort of event-driven um, sort of architectures. Yeah? It becomes very natural. Um, and that has many, many, many benefits. Um, First of all, it becomes very sort of easy to make really small modules that do one thing, right? If you look back into the sort of anatomy of a serverless execution, it's about doing one thing and one thing well, right? So you, you get these really small services. Um, people call them nano services. Not sure I entirely agree with that yet, um, but it doesn't really matter. You like when I talk about um, like a typical size of a serverless function in most of my code base, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, sort of Peter. Um, it's probably about a hundred. Like on average, probably like a hundred lines of code, right? Um, is that sort of 
somewhere, 50, 250. They're really small. Like, and they're really clear in what they're doing. Right? They're parsing the event. They're applying logic. And then they're saving or sending this somewhere. Um, and that's what you get. Right? You get really um, small, very easily composable functions. It makes for an extremely robust architecture. Um, because the way you reuse things um, is, well, the same event happens. And so that particular flow is now used for sort of everything. So it's really easy to um, like grow an application in this particular way. Yeah. Um, one of the fun things is like my startup, Blink, um, got acquired a little over a year and a half ago. And it still runs. There's still customers using it. And, I, and it still works. Right. I, haven't looked at it, I haven't looked at it for about a year now. Right. I have not looked at the code that runs my startup for a year. Right. But I have customers who use this to deploy their production environments. Right. So if it doesn't work, I have people calling me pretty darn quickly. It runs. Right. Haven't logged in. I don't know how many people are using it. I don't know how many deploys I do a day. It's irrelevant. So that's some on the architecture side. Um, what about the like, development side of things when you're writing these um, set of services? One of the most important things, and I can't stress this enough, is that you add features by adding code, you are never or hardly ever updating your code. Right? If I want something to happen when a particular event happens, I don't go into the thing that produces the event and now also call this other thing. I'll just subscribe to that particular event and then do my thing. So I add features by adding code. I'm not, I'd hardly ever need to change existing code to add a feature. And that has like massive benefits when it comes to like a blast radius. Right? I cannot, like it's almost impossible for me to, um, to break something existing if I'm only adding things on the side. And sort of what that means is, yep, sort of Matt, Matt, can you like run, run to Matt there? Uh, oh, thank you. Yep. Uh, I feel bad interrupting. Um, just on that point, I think the idea of um, not breaking things from breaking code, you talked about uh, the, you know, the interconnectivity being what makes this architecture so powerful. How do you guard against breaking the ecosystem by adding new things into it? Yes, great question. Yep. Like, how do you, how do you like, not break the ecosystem? Um, when you're adding these particular features, um, it's, it's, it's about adding like, more connections. It's not about changing existing ones, um, sort of per se. Um, so like, the thing is, uh, we have a, like, a user signs up flow, right? And and that works, and once a user signs up, and uh, there's an event, and then we provision some stuff for them, and the blah, and like, I now want to send them an email. Like, it's the same event, like a user has um, sort of signed up, um, and I now go into my flow that calls some emailing thing to send out that email, right? So it's about adding connections. Um, not so much about changing existing ones. You, you do change existing ones, of course, but not nearly at the level that you used to before. Um, um, so yeah, and because we have these 
like tiny things, what it happens, what I often find myself doing is like either I have use for the entire thing or I do not anymore, right? So even when I'm updating functionality, I am likely to add the replacement, make sure that it works, and then switch over. Right? So even when we're updating uh, code, I usually find myself first adding and then replacing the existing way. Michelle, there's a, there's a long run sort of ahead. White, white shirt in the middle there. Um, so yeah, very different way of thinking about changing software. So um, probably a question around testing then. So if you were oh, to really? really replace yes. your first, let's say your first point. Oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah no, no, go ahead, so ask yeah. your question. So it's probably like if you are replacing code instead of um, updating it, then how yeah. do you ensure that you test all the connectivity? Let's say if you have 10 connections, then down the line, how do you test to make sure that it all still works? How do, you, how do I test? Yeah. yeah, cool, awesome. Like, how do you test this? Uh, which is a great uh, thing. Um, so the first thing is rejoice. I'm like, we can stop writing unit tests. And this may be the first thing Peter and I disagree on, because he, he, he talked about having unit tests. Um, funnily enough, so when I talk like, about uh, uh, testing like a lot of these sort of services, um, I don't actually write unit tests. Right? Um, because they are relatively simple, um, but also what I'll do is I'll, I can sort of test them manually with events, either from a production or um, just an event comes in, and, and do they perform the function at the outside? Yeah. So I, I've never written a unit test for a serverless function as a whole. I've written unit tests for logic, something that I would pack up in a, in a library and then import. Um, but it's almost impossible to write unit tests um, for serverless executions because a, a large part of what makes them work is that interconnectivity. This brings us to the second testing point, which is, and this is why you should go test in production instead. Right? And this always gets sort of the, um, um, like a lot of people very, very nervous. Because for a long time, testing in production mean, sort of meant that uh, we'll check it in production and our users will find the bugs and then we'll fix them, right? And that's not what we do here. Remember that we were talking about like adding functionality. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of the, the things I've been doing um, in, when writing these applications is making sure it was possible to run multiple versions of the same uh, sort of function in production. And depending on which sort of customer or which project you were on, you would code to a particular version or uh, this feature that was under development would be enabled for you, yes or no. Right. So, when I say about sort of testing in production, that didn't necessarily mean that, there, that it was available to all of our customers, but it was available to some of them. Most importantly, me, the developer. Yeah, and this is so, we had no staging environments. Like, in my startup in Link, there was no staging environment. Every single time, when one of the developers went and like, ah, oh, like I want to test this thing, we should really have a staging environment. Uh, I went, no, no, I made a decision to never have a staging environment. I'll get to you in a second. Yep, uh, Michelle will already sort of go on on, on her way to you. Um, um, so there was no staging environment. Yes. So um, every time 
the urge to create a staging environment came up. Um, what we did was we figured out how to make it safe to test in production. Um, and this sort of requires you to do a whole bunch of other things as well, right? Like, I, you need to be able to do that, um, but also you need to be able to sort of monitor and have sort of good observability um, in place to, to make this effective. Yeah. Uh, so when you're talking about testing in production, uh, I'll go along with you. Um, sure, yeah, entertain you just for a moment. In a situation where you are trying something, let's say you're saving some data, and you want to test it, and so you throw it into production, and then it doesn't work the way that you expect it to, and it produces bad data. Yep. How do you protect yourself against ending up with data sources that are just filled with useless trash data that you don't actually want in your production system? Ah, oh, we deleted it. But then you're deleting pr in production. Production data, yes, exactly. Um, so but my point is, I'm like, certainly like in the early stages of a, of a particular feature or a particular thing, like we would only test that for our internal toy accounts, right? And I was happy, and I, we have, in a few occasions, just went like, uh, we're just gonna go and delete that project and create it again, right? So that's what I meant in a sort of, in, in production there was, there was like multiple levels of, um, of, of importance in the, in the data. But yeah, we wouldn't test it on, like a feature in development wouldn't be tested out on a, um, like an important um, set of customer, right? It would be tested out on our internal sort of toy accounts. Um, yeah, ask me again about the time we couldn't delete, we screwed it up, that we couldn't delete the project. Um, er Erwin, um, this is not a question, it's a comment. Oh, one of those. Yeah, um, no, no, give it to me, Peter. Well, I said that my talk was going to be controversial. But <laughs> yeah, I was laughing when you no said that. No more unit tests, <laughs> tests in production, no staging environments, you win. What can I say? <laughs> we had some unit tests, but like, literally, like, like it, we may have had a dozen unit tests. Like, and again, they were for logic, not for testing um, um, things end to end. Yeah? Um, any other? Got two, like that one, and then. So to clarify, are you using tenants effectively as environments? So you can isolate particular changes to a tenant, I uh, guess a customer in this case, and if you don't like it, you've only destroyed a small part of your world? It, 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 um, yeah. So, um, Depending, sometimes it was tenants, sometimes it was a lower, um, d depending on sort of like what we're looking at. But yes, effectively, um, we had, we definitely had tenants where uh, if they, if it screwed up, like that was, that was too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Have you got any more dot points? Do Is I have any more? Dot points in the testing screen? Like I feel like. No, I'm... no, these are the, these are the, right, the two big it. ones. I figured that's we it. had enough discussion sort of after these two. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're, ne we're never moving on from this. Um, <laughs> so, is that, so the, the first time you, you run decent tests is, is in production? There's no like integration testing, so, contract testing? Like, so, um, is, is, we, is what I, we so see, I what we do, get here. So I would do local testing. Um, but it would go from testing it locally on my machine to production, um, sort of straight away. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it did for me too. <laughs> this was the blah, blah. <laughs> Yeah, local testing, production straight away. Doesn't this introduce a problem if there's some flaw in the logic to direct to certain customers? Like if you're a feature toggle or customer um, choosing. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is a, like a great question. Like, what happens if there's a bug in your like feature toggling? Um, which is, well, like, hasn't happened, right? Like, but also very much uh, for us, that was about as um, like sort of simple and straightforward as we kept it. It was literally um, we started out with just hard coded. If it's this particular 
sort of customer ID, this particular product ID, then go do this thing, otherwise do the rest. Uh, and it got a little bit more involved um, sort of as, as time sort of grew. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a thing, it's a general problem with any sort of feature flagging, uh, feature toggling that you, that you have is like, where does it end up? Um, and again, because all of our, like your, your, your functions in themselves are so small, it's, it's, it makes it really easy to reason about them. Um, so, so yeah, but great question. Do we think we can move on? No, no, almost, <laughs> almost. It's okay, we've got plenty of time. Like I was, I was worried that like I was going to have to ramble for 45 minutes. It's lo loving this. Uh, so I'm curious whether you have um, anything else in your process which gets another brain involved. So, uh, you know, code review or, or something like that. Or um, is it literally just one person on their machine, they make their change, they feel confident, and they push it? So well, the question is about like the, the process. Um, so for us, there wasn't. Uh, would I recommend that approach for sort of everyone? Probably not, right? So we're a startup. Like we were generally aware of sort of what was going on. There's a handful of people involved. Um, so in that particular case, it was it was fine. And and again, a lot of that was because like the safety involved sort of with it, right? Because it was that like if it breaks, like I'm going to break like my toy project. Right? We, we all had our sort of individual toy projects that were used to t test different things. Um, so I would break mine, and I had to sort of go, sort of go and fix mine. Um, but yeah, because of the blast radius was so incredibly small, um, we never felt the need to um, like introduce more, more steps in between. Um, if I was going to do this for like larger things, maybe, but maybe not. Like I, I don't have any good answers for that, um, unfortunately. But I would, I would, and again, if there's one thing to take away, um, like, yeah, like, we specifically designed it to not have all of these things um, and only start to do these things unless they were absolutely, completely necessary. Yeah, and we never got to the point where it was necessary to introduce that sort of, um, that other pair of eyes for a particular feature. Yeah? All right. It's great that you're giving Michelle the workout that she, um, so, oh, did you find someone for the question? Ah, there we go. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the. <laughs> so this is all great for programming in the small. I mean, the product you built was fairly simple, I mean, relative to you know, commercial products in the market. And the things that Cloudflare does in large are fairly small and well contained. And I think you, you, what your practices are great hygiene for people building small teams and focusing on these things, which is always a good idea. But I think uh, unless you can demonstrate that these techniques have been applied at scale, uh, I would be concerned about some of the remarks. So um, they are, like, and again, like this is, um, first of all, let me, this is only half joking, um, and but it's not entirely. Um, when, when we talk about sort of like large, um, so so just to sort of go back to um, Cloudflare, um, almost all of our new products are built on top of um, sort of Cloudflare workers, like our development platform, um, where they do have unit tests, um, they do test in production, and they do actually have sort of staging environments. Um, like, we're still talking about, like, a very sizable portion of the internet that sort of goes through. Um, so to call that, like, a small thing is not entirely <laughs> correct. Um, there's a good sort of, sort of 40 million requests a second going through there. Hmm? Oh, yeah, no, Link, Link was a small thing, yeah. 
Uh, my, my point more is, and, and, and so like the thing to take away is like, sort of push these out, push these things out until they become necessary, right? Um, can we do what we do in sort of like, sort of Cloudflare if we didn't have a staging environment? Probably not. Um, maybe, maybe not, but we decided to sort of, obviously there's a million of them in the company uh, for all kinds of different things. But yeah, don't start with all of these. Bring these things in as you're, as you're running into issues. So when something gets too entangled or too large, and you realize, oh, hold on, we, we should have more testing, we shouldn't put everything straight into production, but now we don't have the time to go back and do all of this because it's like a mammoth task. How, 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 do you, how do you implement that once you've already gotten so far? Um, so, my, my experience um, hasn't, um, like, hasn't been binary in this. Right, where we never had an issue, and then we had an unsurmountable issue. Like it was this sort of like ramping up sort of curve um, that where where you're 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 sort of like you're stretching the boundaries, and they're like ah, like this really doesn't um, like doesn't start to work. So it's it it was it was never a like a cliff. Or if it was a cliff, like you were aware that the cliff was there for like a while because you were running, you were running into these sort of issues. Um, so it's it is a matter of um, like hygiene again, right? Like that you sort of you never get too far ahead of yourself um, before you before you start to to do things. And obviously, this was really easy. Um, when I talk about Link, because I was the sort of founder, CEO, um, and I could do sort of whatever the hell I wanted. Um, like in, in larger organizations, there's obviously sort of a lot more involved um, to get sort of this stuff off the off the ground. But if you're if you're talking about like these sorts of sort of architectures, these way of developing software, like that's that should be part of your um, of like the decision making process. I'm like, we can't build this particular feature because it's too big, too unwieldy, and we, do, we first need to have sort of X, Y, and Z in place. Um, but it's, in my experience, it has never been a, like, we now need to spend two months like redoing the entire thing, right? And a lot of that is also sort of foresight. Um, like, not foresight, but like making sure you don't do things um, that you can't, sort of take back. Um, um, so we still had cloud formation templates for everything in such a way that if we had to set up that staging environment, like that would have taken us a couple weeks. Or I should have asked Peter because his cloud formation templates um, always work and upgrade sort of perfectly. Um, for us, it would have taken at least a couple, but it would have been like a week or two's worth of work and we'd have had a staging environment. Yeah? Cool. One um, more question for you. Hmm? Sorry, one Over more? Here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Hey, um, how would this work in a heavily uh, audited safety critical environment where if this breaks, someone is likely to die? Um, so, Luckily, um, we were only doing, like Link, when I talk about my startup, that was only production deploys. Um, so like, people wouldn't sort of die. Um, I think in those environments, stuff like this makes more sense than, um, so has anyone ever ran into an issue that something worked on staging but not on production? Right. That's a lot of people, right? So, I'm like, a good friend of mine, Cherry Majors, um, runs Honeycomb, which is if you ever need to know what your software is doing right now, you should give them a go because they're magic. Um, but, yeah, like, testing in production, like, you're always going to test in production, 
right? Like the only question is, are you going to do it properly or not, right? So this sort of staged rollout into an actual production environment, like that's, so if you're sort of live critical things, you want to have proper testing in production even more than you do uh, when it's about deploying applications to the internet. Um, I can, I, there's so many times um, we've caught things in production on our, on our accounts or even our sort of smaller um, sort of like free accounts, right? Is that what we, we sort of roll out to, to ours and if that works, we roll it out to our free users and if that works, we roll it out to our paid users. Um, like we caught things in all stages. Um, and so yeah, it's even more important in those environments. So uh, quickly, um, talking about operations, um, the one big benefit here is that you can go back to bed um, after you're paged, um, which is both good and bad, right? Um, it's the, it's this, um, I'm running on this platform and um, the platform is down, there's nothing I can do, right? Um, but this is the same when you're talking about sort of any cloud provider, right? This is just sort of a level, a level higher. Um, so let's go talk about some of the financial benefits um, because they're fun too. Lower cost. Peter showed his um, like the, one of the earlier bills in um, sort of a cloud guru, um, which I found interesting because. All of it was, it was basically, if I sort of summarize it properly, it was um, egress fees, cloud watch, and then pocket change for everything else. Um, and so lower cloud spend is, is nice, it's great, but it's completely not the point, right? It's completely not the point. Somehow I think I missed a, a word here. Because um, it's all about the people, <laughs> right? I was having a, a chat with sort of uh, my friend Uli, sort of, sort of in there, and, and like, it's about like how do, you, how do you free up people to do the, the work that you actually want them to do, rather than babysitting um, environments or spinning up environments or testing things. It's about making sure everyone can work on the thing that sort of, sort of sets you apart, differentiates you as a business, right? That's what you want people focusing their, their time on. Like, that's what's making you money, not babysitting a Kubernetes cluster. Oh, God. I was so not going to mention Kubernetes, uh, and then I did. Um, but here's a much more interesting one. Predictable and scalable COGS. Or um, COGS is um, sort of a accountant-y, sort of book term-y, um, bookkeeper's sort of term, and it means cost of goods sold. Right? And it means like the amount of money you spend to deliver your service. Right? And because we are billed per invocation, our spend scales at most linearly with revenue, which is insane and is great. Right? And this is sort of what I, like, I talk to sort of, sort of customers and, and, and sort of things, and they go like, I stop caring what my cloud bill is. In fact, I want my cloud spend to be as high as it could possibly be because that means my revenue sort of scaled up more. Right. That's, that sort of linear, um, like at most, linear s a sort of scalability is incredible. Right. And here's where it gets really exciting. Like knowing exactly how much every operation costs gives you incredible pricing power. Because you can get sort of your pricing sort of at exactly the point you want it to be 
to be competitive in a particular industry. Yeah? You know exactly what your um, spend is going to be and your cost is going to be. Right? This particular operation is going to cost me five invocations, uh, three database writes, and two database reads. Right? That's the whole thing. That's uh, three bucks per million requests. Knowing that gives you an incredible amount of sort of like sort of pricing power. Yeah. We'll sort of do a quick um, thing in the future because I was afraid I was not going to sort of last 45 minutes, but you have been absolutely amazing um, in sort of making sure it was interesting. Um, the most important thing to know about serverless that is not the end, like it is just the beginning. Like we're now at the top of our like technical stack, right? Where the only thing we have left is our business logic code. But this is going to enable a whole bunch of other things. Um, uh, Peter mentioned it sort of, um, sort of uh, as well. It's like the, the, the serverless and SaaS are like merging, integrating. Um, a lot of what we do with CloudFront now is making it so that SaaS providers can give you sort of customer, sort of allow you to run code like in their platforms. Um, and so what we're gonna see is like, the, what, what sort of, um, what we're gonna see is like entire sort of business operations that you can now sort of kick off with um, sort of an APIs and sort of webhooks back um, where Sort of, we're now going to do insurance companies will have a the equivalent of Stripe for managing sort of insurance claims or right we like we can go way up. There's still a lot to go in the sort of like the, the business stack. Um, and what I think we're going to end up with um, is the sort of business as a service. Right, um, Shopify is the sort of biggest example of that now. If you look at it, Shopify is business as a service, right? It's an e-commerce, and I can do just enough to um, be sort of differentiated in my own thing. Um, and I think we're gonna see more and more of those where um, someone will have the template for a particular business where you add just the sort of bit of configuration and, and sort of differentiation um, that you want for that particular sort of type of business. That's it. Thank you so very much, it was an amazing audience. <laughs>